Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Ephesians Bible Study in our home prayer meeting. For our study tonight, we will be looking at the way of the new man marked by wisdom as we look at a new segment in the book of Ephesians tonight. So far, we have learned that the way of the new man is marked by speaking truth, anger without sin, honorable labor, communicating that which is good, pleasing, not grieving the Holy Spirit, grace, love, purity. Tonight, we will begin our studies about the way of the new man marked by wisdom. Our passage today would be Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 to 16, but let us read from Ephesians 5, 15 to 21 that we may be accustomed to the logical flow of our passage. Let's look at our scripture this evening. It says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Before we expound on the Word of God this evening, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, tonight we come before you, and as we see the way of the new man marked by wisdom, Allow us to indeed have our hearts and our minds opened by the Spirit that we would be enlightened by the knowledge and revelation of you through your word. Father, tonight I pray that as we look into your word, may you guide us into all the truth. Help us to see the things you want us to see and the things that we receive tonight. We pray that it would indeed burn in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. For the next weeks, we're going to look at the way of the new man marked by wisdom. And we would see first the characteristic of walking in wisdom in verses 15 to 16. Then we would see the content of walking in wisdom, answering the question, what does wisdom understand? And we will see the expressions of wisdom showing what the Lord wills. Tonight, we will be focusing on the characteristics of the wisdom walk of the new man. So let's expound our passage tonight and see the following things one by one. The first one is this. A call to walk showing consideration. Our passage says in verse 15, See then that ye walk circumspectly. What does that term mean? Now the term only occurs in Ephesians 5.15 and it sounds so much as a big word. But the basic definition of that word simply means careful to consider all circumstances and possible consequences or Prudent. Its etymology shows us it means literally looking about on all sides. Now, if you would look at the word circumspectly, it's a compound word from the word circum, which means around or round about. Then from the word specere or to look. So literally, to look around at all sides. Now, its Greek word has been used and rendered in the King James Bible as diligently 
in Matthew chapter 2 verse 8 and Acts 18 verse 25 as well as perfect in Luke chapter 1 verse 13 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2. And in those verses, if you would check them out, you would realize that the word circumspectly and its Greek equivalent appears with the terms know, search, taught, and understanding. Now, what do you notice about those four terms? That's right. Those are cognitive terms. The idea, therefore, is a careful consideration of our walk. And my friends, in the biblical usage of the term walk, it's not the literal walk, but it's how you live your lives. Now, the new man is wise because he pays attention, pays careful attention to the way that he lives. Now, that is a very important thing to remember. Since we are a new man created after God's righteousness and true holiness, it is important that we pay careful attention how we live. Now, what do we pay attention to? Now, this leads us to our next line, a call to walk showing contrast. Let's continue reading our passage in verse 15 that says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. In our passage, we see two statements. We see a negative statement. It says, walk not as fools. Now, how does one walk like a fool? Maybe your, your imagination when someone walks as a fool is like someone who is not paying close attention or a jester or your like, comedy, etc. But did you know that the, in the biblical usage of the term fool, especially in the Pauline epistles, there are three things that the fool's walk is characterized. Number one, it is a walk of the darkened. Walk of the darkened. Now, let me turn your attention to Romans chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. The Word of God says this, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. A fool's walk is not merely someone who doesn't have an education. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. So anyone, no matter how many PhDs he would hold, but denies the existence of God, the Bible calls him a fool. And these fools have their understanding darkened. And no matter how educated you are, no matter how uh, well read you are, if you do not agree or you do not acknowledge God, the scripture calls you a fool. And you become vain in your imagination. You become, your foolish heart becomes darkened. The way of the fool is the way of the darkened. Number two, the way of the, the walk of the fool is also the walk of the deceived. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. It says here, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Not only is the fool's walk a walk of the darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools, but it is the walk 
of the deceived. Deceived because in deception, many people are bewitched. And in the context of Galatians chapter 3, it's about the gospel message. The gospel message by the Apostle Paul is very simple. He proclaims that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and on the third day he rose again. And by believing on Jesus Christ, we are saved. But someone says, let's add to it. You are saved by believing in Jesus and the works of the law. And what's ironic is many people believe it. Now, October 31 is the day where the Reformation started. Do you know the issue of the first Reformation on that day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses at the wall of the church, the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany? The issue was indulgences. The issue of indulgences is that you buy your pardon and shave off some time in purgatory so that you can go to heaven. And many people bought that and thought it was true. And by the cleverness of words, many were bewitched, deceived, and Many of them have an education. Many of them know the scripture, quote-unquote, but for some unknown reasons, they forsake what the scripture says and allow themselves to be bewitched. The walk of a fool is a walk of the deceived, and in deception, the critical thing is that whether or not you will abandon what the Word of God says. Did you know that the first deception began with these words? Yea, hath God said? Wow! And since the time of Adam and Eve, many people walk the walk of fools because they were bewitched. Darkened? Deceived and the doomed. The walk of fools is the walk of the doomed, and this is shown by the way they talk. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4 talks about foolish talking. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, and Titus chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, the way they talk is that they have foolish questions. Foolish talks. Foolish questions. Now, what makes a question foolish? When it diverts you from that which is essentially and eternally true. The ultimate question that we need to answer is not to find out the secrets of the universe. Our question is not to look for what's not written in the scriptures. But the ultimate question we need to answer is that how can I stand before God holy and without blame before Him? Obviously, the answer to that question is not our own works for we are sinners and it only takes one sin for us to be punished by death. But God provided His Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again. And by His righteousness, we can stand before God holy and without blame. The foolish walk have their foolish talk and foolish questions, and it's shown also by the way they live with foolish lives. Let's look at Titus chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's the way of a fool. And not only that, foolish pursuits. Now let me turn your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. It says this, 
but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content, but they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. The walk of a fool is to pursue the wrong things. Now, in this time of pandemic, one of the realities that we see is the fact of what really matters. Some people have simplistic goals. Many people would be asked, what is your vision in life? And some would say, my vision in life is to be to have my son or my daughter or yourself to walk on the stage in a graduation. But what did the pandemic do? There's no graduations except virtual. What were you wait, wor working for then? Isn't it vanity and foolishness? If you pursue riches, life has been so unstable of late that in the end we say, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Many of us would have pursued so many things in life except that thing that really matters. Isn't that foolishness by definition? Friends, that is how fools walk. They have their understanding darkened, they are deceived, and they are living as fools, pursuing and talking in a way that betrays their folly. But we are not to walk as fools, as our passage says tonight, but we are to walk, as we see in the next, a positive statement, but walk as wise. Simply, for us to live as wise, we do the reverse of the walk of fools. We'll talk about that more next in the weeks to come. But the new man is wise because he lives differently from the rest. He is thinking differently from the rest. And his pursuits are different from the rest. His understanding of what God says and what his word says is stable and secure. That is the walk of the wise. So a new man is wise because he walks not as a fool, but walks as wise. Lastly, we see is the call to walk showing concern. Now verse 16 reads this in our passage. It says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now this has been a favorite verse of many time management seminars and speakers. As a matter of fact, the modern versions had made this about time management. They rendered it saying, making the best use of the time or making most of the time. But I think that is an understatement. I believe that it is written in this way because it wants to convey a very important and urgent truth. So let's understand what it means. It begins with us to understand the concept of the phrase, the days are even. As it is used in the scriptures, we see that evil days are referred to as, number one, days filled with affliction and trouble. That's how Jacob used it in Genesis 47 verse 9. But another one is that it is used as a description of God's judgment against sin. 
in Proverbs 16 verse 4, let's turn to that. In Proverbs chapter 16 verse 4, it says these words. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So, it's a picture of judgment. What do you think is the judgment of the wicked? Remember the verse, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18.20 says this, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In the scripture, death is punishable, a sin is punishable by death. So that's the judgment of God. The wicked is made, are made for the day of evil. Also, it refers, refers to days when the evil prosper and wage war against the righteous. That's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. We'll learn more that, of that when we reach that segment. But it says this, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. In Galatians, we hear there that the People, the children that are born of the flesh persecute those who are born after the Spirit. If you're a Christian and you experience difficult times from wicked people, friend, that is normal. It's not, the, it's not something that you are supposed to be surprised as you are a believer, you will be persecuted by those who reject your message. It's normal. And that makes the day even. If you're a believer and your goal in life is to feel at home in this world, I need to wake you up. Wake up, bro. You're not meant to be comfortable here. Your goal and your hope is that God would deliver us from this present wicked world. That's our hope. Our hope is not to have this Jesus and say, I'll live a problem-free life. No, that's the wrong Jesus. That's the wrong Jesus. Remember what they did to Jesus Christ? Wasn't Jesus rejected by his own people? Do you remember what happened to the 12 apostles? They were all rejected. How about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul said, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherewith I suffer trouble even as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. That is why this day is our even now if that's the concept of an evil day of the evil days meaning a day full of affliction the judgment against sin which is death and that the wicked are waging war and prospering against the righteous so what's the concept of redeeming what does the word redeem mean i believe that's the important word because of its nuances now, here are the nuances of the term redeem, okay? Number one, repurchase, which is to buy back, to get back or win back, to free from captivity by payment of a ransom, and to extricate from something detrimental. Now, the truth is, this is what Jesus Christ has done for us. We belong to Him. Apostle Paul said that we live and move and have our being in Him, but because of sin, we had been separated from God. Man cannot go back to God because of our sin, but God did provide a solution for our sin problem, and that is Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day He rose again. By that payment, 
he redeemed us and reconciled us back to God. That's the concept of redemption. To buy back, to get back or win back, and to free from captivity by payment of a ransom. Exactly what Jesus did. Now, redemption also means to change for the better. That's the concept of reform. To make good, which is fulfilled, and to make worthwhile, as in to retrieve. Now, therefore, to redeem the time because the days are evil means, number one, it is to redeem the time knowing that the judgment can fall anytime upon a person and we must make it worthwhile by telling them the gospel that Jesus was delivered for their offenses, for our offenses, and raised again for our justification. The truth is, the days are evil because you don't know how long anyone has. Life is uncertain that way. Sometimes you would say, I will share the gospel to someone I care about later. But you are you can't be presumptuous nor arrogant enough to presume a later would come. What if it doesn't? Then that person will be lost forever under the judgment of a holy God who hates sin and justly punishes it. How would you feel if there's no more time to tell that person about what Jesus has done? Maybe you're afraid and say, maybe he will reject me. And so, he will reject you, yes! But, but, he will reject you. But, at least, you got the message through. That's why it's very important that you know your message well. You cannot invent it. You cannot twist it. You cannot invent a new gospel. No, there's only one gospel in this dispensation that can save us. And if that's, that's the only way to be saved, that is urgent, very urgent. That's why we redeem the time. Because at any moment, we don't know the life and when the judgment of God, which is death for sin, will fall upon that person. There might be no later. Number two, it is to redeem the time knowing that despite the afflictions of this world, we have hope being redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, making sense of suffering, making life fulfilling. Many times the greatest question in life is, why am I suffering? Apostle Paul had his share. If, if you would look back in Ephesians chapter 3, Apostle Paul says, I would that you would not faint of the tribulations that I have. And Apostle Paul, when he says tribulations, he's not really kidding. He talks about, in Galatians, people who bewitch. In Corinthians, he talks about people who are, he is in danger of false brethren. In Philippians, he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. And it's not, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not easy. But Paul says, I would not that you faint for my tribulations. Why? Because as he presents the, the gospel in the dispensation of grace, for him to see God strengthening the Ephesians and us in our time today, strengthened in the inner man, having Christ dwell in our hearts by faith, us knowing the love of God by the gospel that he preaches, it's worth it. It's worth it. In this world, we will suffer. But isn't it more fulfilling to suffer for the right things? They can persecute you for your lack of integrity. That's a terrifying thing. They can persecute you because they don't like some of your habits. That's a terrifying thing. But isn't it a noble thing 
that the reason why they hate you so much is because you bring the gospel to them that they don't want to hear. They wanted the gospel that would make them feel good. They wanted the gospel that they would have all the cliches of the world offered to them on a silver platter. They want the gospel that they are the lead man. And they are the savior of themselves. But that is a false gospel. And the world hates the true gospel. That it is not our faith that saves us, but it is the faith of Jesus Christ. That all work is all the work of Jesus Christ, not of us. And we have no boast in our salvation. And maybe you're saying, we have no boast? Well, that's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My friends, the world hates the gospel of the grace of God because it gives God the greatest glory and it removes any work from us. Because our salvation, the gospel that the apostle brings is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, Him being just, Him being delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. If the world will hate us, it's a noble thing that the world will hate us for the gospel message. If we would imitate the Apostle Paul, the world hated him for, the, him, for him for that. And let us also have that message no matter what. Number three, it is to redeem the time knowing that despite the evil of this world, we are called to walk in the way of the new man, affecting when able, reform if possible. If you would look back to the series of the new man, it's quite different from what is usual. Sadly, it's different from what's usual even in the churches today. Lying has become the way of life even for pastors, that's sad to say communication of what is good is foreign. But foolish talk, it's normal. Comedies in the pulpit, comedies in the teaching podiums, entertainment, it's normal. But redeeming the time, preaching the gospel message, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, it's missing. But my friends, the way of the new man is the way that we are to live. The way of the new man is wise because he lives with a concern redeeming the time because the days are evil. The Apostle Paul instructs believers to walk in wisdom showing consideration, contrast, and concern to redeem the time. Brothers, the way of the new man is marked by wisdom. I pray that as we look into the word of God this evening, we would remember to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days, because the days are evil. Father, we thank you for your word today, and I pray that we would indeed walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Father, may the truths that we have received from your word this evening simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. Thank you very much for listening and we would love to hear, uh, for, uh, uh, hear from you and if you have any prayer requests, questions, comments, or anything of the sort, you can type it in the comment section below or send us a private message. Hope to see you in our future broadcasts. On Saturday, we have the Comfort Verses in Context. And every Monday, by, uh, every Monday, by God's grace, as the Lord wills, we release a video of the Family Equipping Ministry. Hope to see you again next week as we study the Book of Ephesians. Do have a nice day. And the Lord bless you.